Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about space exploration. Um, so it's going to be the 50th anniversary of the first lunar landing. Um, and as someone who was a very keen astronomer when I was growing up and someone who went to university to study astrophysics, I could hardly let this event pass by without a few little thoughts myself. First of all, let's just do a little bit of potted history though, because as a Briton, I'm sort of uniquely placed between the two nations that were very much involved in the space race and there's no particular patriotism towards one or the other. Uh, it started out actually, of course, with the Soviet Union very much winning. And there's one particular part of it where the university I went to, the University of Manchester, which is famous for its Jodrell Bank uh, radio observatory, uh, has a role to play in that as well. So initially the Soviet Union were making the gains. They were sending the, the, the monkeys up into space and, and the dog Laika, the dog, and, and I, I don't know about you, when I was growing up, I was told that they sent this dog up and then they brought it back. And there was film footage of the dog back on Earth. I know better now, that was not the same dog. The, the, the actual dog they sent up cooked pretty quickly. It did not last long. But it culminated eventually with sending the, the first man into orbit, Yuri Gagarin, who unfortunately and rather embarrassingly, this Soviet hero, Went up in space, went round the world, came back down, right as rain, and then died in a, in a crash. Um, but that was the Soviet Union at that point, steamrolling ahead. And there was this, it was like an ideological competition because at the time the United States promoting, uh, you know, capitalism and democracy. And you had the Soviet Union who were espousing the exact opposite of all that. Um, and it was seen as an ideological conflict, effectively, but, but a, a more pleasant one than nuclear war, at least. Um, but then, of course, we had um, Sputnik launched. So the satellite, the first artificial satellite launched into space. Now, just to bring the sort of British element into here. So we have Jodrell Bank at the University of Manchester Radio Observatory. In the 1950s, it was being constructed, but it was very difficult. It was, con it was the brainchild of someone called Sir Bernard Lovell, who had helped develop radar during the Second World War for detecting incoming planes. And he realized that we could use this for astronomical purposes, and he wanted to build a large installation. A bit of a struggle getting money in those post-war years. And then, all of a sudden, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. Now, the Western powers did not know what Sputnik was. For all they knew, it was a spy satellite. It had cameras in it and it could use, be used to spy out, you know, Western military bases. In the end, it wasn't. It was just a metal ball that went beep. But they didn't know that. They needed to track it. They wanted to know what it was up to. Where in the world can we track this thing? Oh, look, there is an installation over in Cheshire in the United Kingdom that is capable of tracking it. All of a sudden, the money came flooding in because it turns out, actually, when you need money for military purposes, there's actually quite a lot of it about. So Jodrell Bank got finished. We had to track Sputnik for a bit, but then we got a radio observatory out of it. Bargain, I would say. So then, of course, in the 1960s, in a, in a drunken boast, the president at the time, President Kennedy, said, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Um, without really, I gather, having any idea that this would happen. I think it was just seen as, as that can-do American spirit, the American dream. Um, but then they did it. It happened. You know, a man landed on the moon. Now, I wasn't about at the time. I hadn't even been born, let alone old enough to really appreciate the moment. And, and so I can only imagine... Because what I think is, and I don't know what people who would have remembered it would have thought at the time. Because to me, I cannot think of a single event in my entire life that has felt as I think I would have felt were I born for a start and old enough to be conscious of, of events in 1969. You know, I can remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, for example, and... Um, and that was a, a good moment. But I, I, in terms of real human achievement, the idea of, of, for the first time, putting someone on the moon, to me, would have been quite breathtaking. And I, it's quite sad in a way 
the for me in the 50 years hence and technologically of course we've done great things as well um but i cannot think of anything that we have done in the 50 years since whether an individual country as in the case here the united states or whether as mankind as a collective that we have done that's really captured the imagination in the same way i can't think of anything that would have had the whole world just stop in silence and go well, um, I gather that the, um, was it Walter Cronkite? Someone like that. Who was the, the broadcaster in the United States? Who, much like Neil Armstrong, I mean, this, this cobbler's about one small step for man, but giant leap for mankind. Obviously, that was not off the cuff. So he probably didn't even come up the line himself. He says, here, Neil, this is your line. Memorize it and then destroy the evidence. This is what you are saying. Don't mess it up. Um, and And... and and this broadcaster apparently was, you know, he, he wanted to say something equally profound to mark the event and found that he couldn't. Um, it was that awe-inspiring. And, and, and what I think is quite sad for me as well. So when I was growing up, this event had already happened. The, you know, you'd been to the moon a few more times. We'd had Apollo 13 a couple of missions later where, of course, it all went very badly wrong. But again, it made a great film and everyone survived. So that was good. And... But when I was growing up, it was all all the talk was about going to Mars, and this was the nat next natural step. It was like it was part of a journey somewhere. But of course, that's not what happened. We haven't, and I'm not saying that we should, because obviously, you know, just to bring a little bit of politics politics into it, I understand as a physicist, I'm aware that the two really great branches of physics you've got astrophysics at one end, which is is my thing. You've got particle physics at the other end. Both of them are incredibly expensive. You know, the, the missions, the, the, the machinery you need, everything just costs a fortune. You know, if you need a much larger particle accelerator, costs a fortune. If you need to send out space missions, costs a fortune. And I get that people will look at it and they'll go, well, we could spend that same money on healthcare. Uh, we could spend it on like, you know, alleviating poverty so many things we could spend it on and i can argue that actually there's a lot of technology we have now that makes our lives better that we would not have had without the space mission we wouldn't have our smartphones you know um we wouldn't have sat nav we'd still be driving around with a map you know crashing into hedges and um and there's a lot of things we've had directly from space missions there's some things we've had indirectly we wouldn't even think about um that you know were developed because of the need to develop things on a lighter, smaller scale, for example, for space missions. Um, and I can argue that, but at the end of the day, it is difficult to argue, isn't it, that the sheer amount of money being spent on it, when uh, uh, the, as yet, um, we haven't had a practical use, for example, from going to the moon. And if we had have gone to Mars, and if we do go to Mars, then at the moment, there's no practical benefit. There could be in the future. Uh, and we can't just wait until that need is there, you know. Um, but it is a difficult one. But what disappointed me, I think, growing up, as it started to become clear that it wasn't going to happen, especially once the Soviet Union collapsed, that was it. It was like space missions off the menu now. And at that point, it sort of dawned on me, even at the tender age of, oh, what, how old would I have been? About 12, when the Berlin Wall fell, 12, 13, something like that, that um, I just thought to myself, yeah, so all, all it was, this whole space race, killing that dog, sticking a few people on the moon, risking everyone's lives. Ultimately, the fact that it stopped at that point just sort of said to me, all it was was a giant penis measuring competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. And as soon as the United States were in a race of one, all of a sudden it wasn't that urgent to get to Mars anymore. So that was a little disappointing. That was a little disappointing, I have to say, in terms of my, my personal views on that. So I'll, I'll leave it there, as I say. I thought I ought to mark the event as, a, as an astrophysicist. Uh, let me know your comments below, especially if you do remember at the time. What was it like? What did people think about it? And anyway, until next time, I'll see you later.